Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak with you today about the future of medicine. It may seem to you like those three or four words are, are, are quite obvious what they mean, and so you can predict what I'm going to say. But I would point out that this quotation from William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. I think not only do most people know that quote, but it's become a kind of subconscious motivator of some people. And so when they are asked to give a talk about the future or the future of medicine, secretly they realize that it's much easier to talk about the present. So if they can find parts of the present that the audience doesn't know about and they do, then that's a much easier talk to put together. You can get visuals and, and, and text and, and, and everything and it, it's much less risky than speculating on the future because the present you can already know exactly what it's like. So in that sense a lot of people giving talks about the future or the future of medicine are actually talking about the present and just secretly hoping that they know things about the present that people in, in the audience don't. And uh, of course it, it's also true that it's not so clear that everybody has a common understanding of what medicine is. Um, to you medicine may be all about disease but if you think about medicine in the future we could reach a point where the diseases we know today are gone. They're prevented, they're, 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 they're easily treated, they, they just don't occur anymore. And physicians are using their skill then to augment normal human beings, to make them think faster, run fa faster, uh, be taller, or whatever. And uh, that may seem to you like very different from medicine, but it, I mean, we have some medicine like that today. It's kind of just kind of a shift. So um, I have been teaching a course called Technology in the Future of medicine and, and this has caused me to have a lot of uh, very interesting musings ab ab about uh, what one means by the future and what one means by medicine. But you know ideally a talk about the future of medicine should tell you about things that haven't occurred yet and yet give you tangible visuals and auditory things that you can take away. So when you leave the room, you, you have something to remember the presentation by. And I'm now going to play you a video, and it's only three minutes, it's not going to hurt very much, and it's produced by the European Union, which is a big entity. So it's probably a pretty good video. And you will find in it, first of all, it describes something that does not exist yet, but is very logical, and you can see the need for it. And secondly, it, it has very remarkably memorable visuals and audio and high points and all that sort of thing. So to me, it is uh, the quintessential example of what a presentation on the future of medicine today really should be like. The number of molecules that make up our human bodies is gigantic, and the ways in which they all interact is mind-boggling. But science has become very good at measuring huge amounts of biological data like our personal DNA sequence, our proteins, and metabolites. If we could make all this data useful, we would be able to provide much better healthcare. Making healthcare and medicine more successful, more reliable, faster, and less expensive is one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. To make sense of all our biological data, healthcare needs revolutionary new information and communication technologies. The European flagship program ITE Future of Medicine, IT FOM, will develop these technologies to benefit everyone and deliver truly personalized medicine. So, how do we get there? By making computer models of our biological data, we can make detailed health checks or simulate medical treatment before applying it. Computer simulations already help us everywhere. Weather models tell us tomorrow's weather and we test airplanes in the computer before we build them. So, why not use simulations in medical care? Well, the human body is more complex than the weather or airplanes, but computers keep improving. 
Health simulations can be made if we measure biological data and make mathematical models that run on smart and powerful ICT. So, what are these mathematical models? Trillions of molecules make up our cells and billions of cells make tissues and organs, making a huge network that is our body. So, when we're ill, our network has some problem. If doctors could analyze our network in the computer, they could simulate which treatment would work best. We could all own a virtual patient model to help us throughout our lives in both curing and preventing disease. So what will IT form do? We will accelerate the development and use of cutting-edge science, technology and medicine through groundbreaking ICT to revolutionize medicine for Europe and the world. Our personal health models will allow us to make breakthroughs in treating complex diseases. Healthcare will become more effective and less expensive. And new high-tech industrial and economic opportunities will emerge, creating a stronger and healthier society. Europe will lead the way in modernizing medicine and revolutionizing ICT. Europe's gift to the world. Okay, so now you see what I meant. The images and sound bites in that three-minute video from the European Union certainly will have grabbed you. I mean, you're, you're kind of a changed person now, a little bit, tiny bit changed, and when you leave the room, you will remember the video. And it's how presentations should be. They, 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 they should have something for you to hang on to. They should not be completely nebulous, abstract, uh, and yet they should describe, if they're talking about the future, something that does not exist yet. So with regard to the technological singularity, it's been hard to do that in the past. I, I've, I've had much occasion to think about that as I taught the course on technology and the future of medicine at the University of Alberta. Now, why didn't we have the word singularity in the title of the course? Well, most people don't know what that word means. You can't have course name, or most people don't understand the words. But yet, almost every teaching session, we talk about the technological sing singularity. And, and, and so, uh, how uh, memorable, tangible, real is it? Well, I think luckily it's become a lot more real and tangible and, and associated with uh, memorable things very recently. First of all, in, in February 2011, two things happened. And you could be excused for not knowing about the singularity at all before February 2011. But in that month, the singularity appeared on the cover of Time magazine and the computer Watson won on Jeopardy. And both those were remarkable things. And was apparent not that Watson just happened to win, but he won over the top two human contenders and it is clear that he would have been able to beat any human contender. So suddenly at that moment, computers were better than human beings at the game of Jeopardy. So we, we have taught in the course about the singularity, about existential risks, AI, genomics, and nanotech, ways to optimize the positive outcome for humanity and the co-evolution of humans and machines, and in the influence of these considerations on medicine of the future. And we've taught about the possibility of something extremely positive, a post-scarcity world described in this recent book by Peter Diamandis called Abundance, where basically everything's getting better, getting cheaper, easier. You, 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 can, you can imagine the very, very positive world that, that awaits us in the future. And in such a world, as I've said, it's very likely that medicine will be about enhancement of well people and not about disease. Now, you probably wish that I would bring you a bit of the future, and I've done that. You see, it's only April, and here you have the May-June issue of The Futurist. <laughs> so, that's, that's a bit of the future. And in that issue is an, ish, a, a, an article 
um, by Aubrey de Grey, about a thousand years young, and he's talking about reversing aging, not just preventing aging or allowing us to live a long time where we become sort of all like wrinkled prunes, but actually a, a, a situation where we could live a long time and still be youthful. And you could imagine in that kind of world that the whole concept of what medicine is would change quite profoundly. We need to consider the possibility of a post-scarcity world and what medicine would be like in such a singularity utopia. The technologic singularity is basically the situation where machines become smarter than we are, take over the agenda of the world, only then by cooperating with machines can we understand what's going on, the machines um, are in charge, and they are able to self-improve very quickly. So the moment that they're as smart as we are, they will then become much, much smarter than we are very quickly. Ray Kurzweil is the person who has done the most research in this area, also founded Singularity University, where I took the nine-day executive course in the spring of 2010. Part of what was emphasized in that course is Moore's Law and uh, exponential change. This is an article from four days ago suggesting that maybe Moore's Law doesn't apply so much in medicine. There are many rigidities in medicine and they probably have the effect of muting Moore's Law. Regulatory oversight completely focused on compliance discourages risk-taking and innovation. Healthcare doesn't have the same financial reward system. You can't imagine Facebook going to pay a billion dollars, the latest hot ticket item in medical imaging or uh, informatics. And in medicine, security always trumps uh, information sharing. So better, faster linkages are constrained because of security concerns, and many of those are, are not legitimate uh, concerns. Now, it, it, you may know about medical apps, and you may say, but they're all those medical apps. And I just want to tell you something about medical apps. Now, I probably carry more devices than anybody that you know. I have here, I think, seven devices with me today. Let's look at medical apps. Okay, so this is my iPad 2, and uh, if you look, I have 186 apps beyond the ones that come with the device when you buy it. How many of those are medical? Four. How many of those four have I actually used? I only used one. So there's one called Surgery 101, which has Jonathan White's uh, podcasts and uh, lectures in it. I've used that one. I haven't used any of the others. And so that is kind of a trend. People are not using medical apps. There's a different reward system. People end up creating apps which nobody uses in this area. It, it, it's unlike other areas where things are very much uh, consumer driven and the apps are created because the consumer wants them. That's not exactly how things work in medicine. And so why isn't the technology adopting to people's needs rather than the other way around? It's, 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 it's a very good question. So we, we have in this area many intriguing questions about how medicine is different and how hard it is to get the ideas across. How many people could we reach about the technological singularity? Well, in the US alone, there are 16 million people watching the Big Bang Theory. How many people do we reach? Uh, well, the Singularity Summit, the highest profile meeting every year about uh, the Sing singularity, those videos max out at about 9,000. You have the difference between 9,000 and 16 million then. And the videos from my course on uh, technology and the future of medicine max out at about 500. And the videos from the Singularity Institute of Artificial Intelligence about itself and its programs also max out at about 500. So, um, we, we need to do something to, to, to make this more riveting and interesting and, and to engage the general public. 
and um, to give it memorable, memorable visuals. Uh, and we are now able to do that, thanks to Marcus Hutter and his February 28th, 2012 article, Can Intelligence Explode? In this article, he talks about the singularity inside and outside. He talks about what it would look like, what it would feel like, what it would sound like, all things that we haven't had before. And he points out that this challenge of friendly AI, how can we make sure these super intelligent machines are friendly to us, is really just a small subset of a much larger problem of human insignificance. How are we going to remain significant and, and really players in the world when the machines are so much smarter than we are? And it becomes an urgent problem because Hutter has developed general AI. Maybe many people think that general AI is a long way off, but uh, he created in 2005 a general AI program describable in this one line. You see her here at the top. And that is able to master all 1980s arcade games. You can say these are just recreational games, but they contain many prototypical elements of human life. And so the, the AI is able to master tic-tac-toe and coon poker and Pac-Man and many other entities. Next would come Second Life, and then next would, would come maybe real, real life here. <coughs> So um, we're, we're kind of stuck then in, 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 in a sort of a situation that is uh, the best of times and the worst of times. That on the one hand, the capability of post-scarcity and abundance would be there. Also the capability of complete human insignificance, a feeling of aimlessness sense of purpose uh, completely being lost, and maybe human identity being lost. Why would it matter what individual human beings did when the agenda of the world is all in the hands of machines? So we could eliminate all disease and still have a terrible world. The challenge of AI becomes just a small part of the much larger challenge creating a friendly world in which humans still have lives of significance and human history is retained and extended. Don't you think a positive outcome is possible and that working together we can make it likely? And we could all work on this. The problem of friendly AI, you, you can imagine that you need to be an AI researcher to work on that, but the problem making the, the world a friendly place for biological humans and a place in which they still have significant things to, to do and a significant role, that's something we could all work on. So on the one hand, part of the imagined future could be one where all disease was, was eliminated, but nevertheless, life was completely intolerable. Or, or another world where there were lots of diseases, but they were all from bioterrorism. All of the, the, the original diseases are gone, and you have only the, the ones created by uh, bad guys that are brand new. So we would welcome suggestions of how to capture the imagination of the public to start everyone thinking about these matters. We need to main to, to mainstream the idea of the technological singularity, to have everybody thinking about it as fact, not fiction. We need to promote organized thinking about the future in universities and beyond to make a better world for all of us. Thank you very much. <clears throat>